So let me introduce myself. My, I am Corey Miller. I am the application manager for Sierra Monitor Corporations out of Milpitas, California. Um, this has been actually one of my um, my dreams, and the guys in the panel go like, you really need to get help. Um, but to have this kind of a forum, I've been involved with NFPA for a long time and have worked with uh, Fire Authority in Southern California for even longer. And I've always had an aspiration to talk about uh, where we're going to go. I've always been involved in several committees, including NFPA 72 and some of the regulations that go through there. And I have to share with you in terms of NFPA, I, I believe very strongly in the regulation recommendations that we write. And I think the process we do it, the parliamentary process, is perfect. But I also know that every time I go to NFPA, I have some very interesting conversations with first responders and manufacturers and engineers in the hallway around the NFPA conferences talking about what we can do different. So today's discussion is going to be held by our panelists. We have first held Bill Denning. Bill. Hello. Bill Denning is with Otiki, <laughs> manufacturer. <laughs> then we have Mark Pavlika. Mark is with Siemens. Then we have Tom Parrish out of Putman Township. He's a fire inspector. And we have Mike McDade, a very old friend of mine, a engine, fire engineer out of Southern California. So for an introduction, I have to get this little word out. This is not sanctioned by the NFPA. I have to make sure I protect myself and our company. Uh, but we are here definitely to open up discussion. And if you guys are too quiet about it, I'll get really worried. But the reality is there's two young ladies in the back that are going to hand you a microphone if you want to say something. And please, wait till you get the microphone before you begin to talk. All right? The disciplines we have are first responders and preventive fire. We also have obviously manufacturers and we also have the service aspect of it in the installation with Mike McDade's group. And today we're, I really wanted you guys to walk away from here with maybe some innovative ideas on something that we can do different. I know that we have a lot of regulations and a lot of things that we do with panels specific around NFPA 72 and some of the other regulations, but the whole point here was to kind of fly at the 10,000 foot level, take a look at where we can go, what can happen, and we're gonna walk through that process a little bit. So, without further ado, the agenda will begin with mass notification. That's a very broad term, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that and what the importance is and how we can do that. We're gonna talk about remote service. Uh, one of the capabilities, in other words, to be able to work on a fire alarm panel from a remote capability, and where we are with that. We're going to take a look at it from remote support. As a manufacturer, do I have access to a fire alarm panel? And again, we'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, I want to talk about the smart building. And I'll explain when I get into there what I'm talking about specifically in the smart buildings. All right? So before I get too far, and I've kind of missed over it, I want to really introduce the guys that got me fired up on this. We have Lindsay Allen, and we have Amber Livingston in the back, part of the marketing team, and the director of this, Steve, stand up, Steve. Steve Shaw was the one that uh, uh, that's this whole thing started with a conference meeting at Sierra Monitor and they basically looked at me and said, can you tell us about fire alarm panels? And I said, absolutely not. I have no idea what the hell. But then we began to talk about it and I began to realize that I was very passionate about some things within the fire alarm panel because of a lot of our integration capabilities with the cloud and stuff like that. So we're gonna get to that. But let's begin with mass notification. So at this point, I'm gonna probably call on a couple of guys and one of the things that uh, to share with you is notifying local personnel. And one of the comments that I made with these guys when we were talking before, and I think it was Mark, and we're trying to remember, um, that we were talking about specifically was, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could have a fire alarm panel that could actually activate a cell phone in a particular environment locally? All right. Well, we know within our own organization, we have the cloud capability to do that. But Mark, what is your thoughts, if you would? I'd, I'd like to, thanks, thank you. I'd like to point out that at the beginning of the meeting, you asked everybody to turn their cell phones off. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so if we had a fire So if we were job. relying on your cell phone to let you know something is happening, we're all in the dark simply because we're in a meeting. Okay, we're done with Mark now. <laughs> <laughs> So, Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> You're supposed to turn the ringer off. 
<laughs> good thing is nobody listens. That's true. Nobody <laughs> listens, obviously. Or else they wouldn't be able to take pictures. All right. Bill, do you want to add anything? I don't get too involved with mass notification. Uh, part of it, really. We don't have any products that fit that. But obviously, um, there's a need for that. And uh, being able to get the message out, uh, distributed recipients and things of that sort, would, would serve a very valuable uh, purpose. Okay. Tom? Uh, mass notification has taken uh, very di various different forms over the years, the last couple cycles of the code. Uh, since it first got added to 72, it's uh, you know, kind of morphed into a, a larger animal than we thought. Um, you have one-way and two-way notification as well as uh, mass notification. And the biggest thing about that is, or the biggest failure that we've seen in mass notification from a response side and a, and a, a design side, has been a failure to do an adequate uh, risk analysis. Have you identified everything, and is it a realistic risk analysis, and do you have all the right players there? Because a lot of people want the mass notification system to be the Swiss Army knife of notification for the facility, but they want to do it on a razor knife budget. Okay? Um, if you're going to do it right, do it right. The codes are a minimum. If you're at the AFA breakfast, I said the same thing. The codes are a minimum. You can exceed them. It's okay. <laughs> All right? And then mass notification and things like that, that's one of those places where, you know what? You, when you want it to actually do everything you want it to do, you are going to have to exceed the codes. All right. Mike, you want to add anything to that? I uh, pretty much nailed it right there. Um, as a contractor, when we see it in a spec, it's it's a little uh, interesting because the, no two systems are alike in what they're asking for and what the, the local uh, municipality is asking for as well. Uh, we see text, we see visual, we see both. So um, it's a great feature. Um, I think it just needs to be redefined defined a little bit more. One of the things that I wanted to mention that brought me up on this particular subject in terms of mass notification was I was doing a fire test with a local authority in Los Angeles, and Inspector Allen and I were setting horns and strobes off in the tunnels in the subways of L.A. Yes, there are subways in Los Angeles. Um, in reality, what he came to me and he said, is there any way we can make those damn horns and strobes more intuitive? And I said, well, first of all, you're not supposed to stand around and listen to them. You want to get out of the building. And he said, but there's got to be some way to do that. I was really excited this year because the first time I saw in a couple of manufacturers where we actually had the, the required temporal level of audio visual going, and then it would stop and it would give a vocal command, which is something I hadn't seen before. And I thought that was really exciting. That doesn't mean it hasn't been around. I just hadn't seen it before. But it's exciting to see that we can start to move towards that type of thing, and there we actually have the ability to tell a public where they can move to or what they need to do. So it's not just a blaring horn. I'm sure everyone in this room who has ever been in a fire drill looks at, when that horn goes off, the drill in the head, the deer in the headlight look, as everybody stands around and looks at each other about where to go. And I think that's what I was trying to achieve with the mass notifications. Anything to add to that, Mark? You mentioned earlier. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you specifically talked about cell phones. And, and I agree that cell phones are a great way to reach people. But I also believe it's not the only way to reach people. And you mentioned voice systems. Absolutely. If you're going to use an emergency response system to tell people to do different things rather than traditionally just there's a fire, get out of the building, then you need to be able to tell people specifically what to do. If you're in a school in Oklahoma and there's a tornado coming, somebody pulls the pull station, you're telling the kids to get out of the school. Bad idea. You need a voice system to say, go to the basement instead. Or whatever the hazard is, a voice system where you can give people instructions helps them respond appropriately to whatever the emergency is. Tom, any thought on that? Or... Uh, he's right on. If you look in the... Uh... The 2019 edition of 72, I know a lot of people haven't gotten up into that edition yet. Probably will be a you know, cycle or two on the building until to, to it catches up. Um, there are actually, uh, there was a new annex uh, added, Annex G, which is Guidelines for Emergency Communication Strategies. And it also has some uh, sample messages in there that address the different types of messages that you're looking for in the, the notification system. So it's exciting to me that we're starting to see a lot of the future issues actually getting addressed. And I want to make sure that everybody understands, in this room, this is not just the five of us talking. If you have a thought or if you think I'm out of my freaking mind, I'm open to that. I will probably cut you off. But 
If you want to say something, please tell me. Uh, we've got some microphones in the back, and the guys will bring them to you. Just wait till the mic comes to you. Just raise your hand. Gordon? Yeah. Wait for your microphone. Don't get yelled at. <laughs> you are out of your freaking mind. <laughs> That wasn't a question. That might have been a statement. Drop the mic and walk away. That's all you can do at that point. So what, what comes to my mind in this part of the discussion, of course, we all know there's lots of mass notifications. And having lived in the Bay Area in California and seen mass notification when the refineries have problems, there's a whole lot of ramifications that don't need discussion here. But I happen to have been living in a hotel for far too many months at the moment. And the hotel was undergoing renovation. And there have been many false alarms of the fire system. And it comes to my mind that we think about mass notification outside of the building. But most hotels know the cell phone number of everybody who's staying there, or a large number of them. So mass notification could be internal, too, so that the, the fire system tells the people in the rooms stay in the room, ignore the, ignore the fire, get out, whatever. Um, they're in a place that's not normally uh, something that they know it, the best way to get out. Um, so there, there could be a lot of information that goes out rather than a screaming fire alarm in your room and you don't know whether to open the door or not. Excellent point. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate it. Anybody else want to add anything before we kind of move on? Well, come on, you guys aren't all that quiet about it. I've heard all of you talking in the hallway. All right. Next subject I want to talk about is first responder reporting and recognition. Now, what I meant by this when I put this talking point together, I have a vision where a firefighter has on his suit uh, some type of a proximity or, or some type of an identification capability that when they go to a fire panel, they actually get recognized by the fire panel. And the reason I have this is because I've worked with enough first responders to know that at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I have a fire alarm, I'm wearing my glove, and those panels buttons aren't that small. I mean, aren't that large. And it's difficult. And one of the discussions we've had in the hallway is how do you remedy that? I've actually seen some manufacturers with remote uh, enunciators have huge buttons on them to be able to acknowledge it. But if we had the idea, and I'm throwing this back out the panel and you guys, if we had the ability to walk up to a panel and be able to recognize as a first responder and use vocal commands, to address that panel, maybe we wouldn't have that issue. And again, we talked about this earlier, guys. I'm going to you, Bill, and say, thought on this one? It seems possible. Um, you know, most panels have an interface where we can jump into an access level where they could silence, reset, uh, resound the alarm, and things of that sort. Um, the external equipment that would receive that signal, you know, whether it be a proximity or voice recognition or whatever, obviously that would need to be something external to the system. But I think most fire panels could accept an input, maybe a dry contact or some other interface, and make that uh, sort of thing happen. A lot of fire panels already just have a level two or enable key yep. that also could be uh, used. Some panels are going with um, resistive uh, touch screens or things like that that could work with the glove. Granted, the buttons would need to be large enough so that you don't press five buttons uh, with one, uh, you know, finger stroke there. But it, it seems reasonable, an easier way for them to be able to access the system, to get the information they need, and to be able to manipulate uh, the system. Before I go to Tom, because I know Tom's got a thought. Mark, you want to add anything to that real quick? Um, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. And, you know, uh, it's, it's always been an accepted fact that the firemen responding to a fire will keep their gloves on. And so having touch screens do that, uh, ha operate, you know, requiring someone to use a touch screen to operate a system has always been something that as a manufacturer we've been uh, very aware of. In fact, our responder mode doesn't require a touch screen, but the technician mode does, and we did it specifically for that. But the stories I hear now is every fireman is on his cell phone texting on the ride on the way to the fire to say what's happening and it's not such a big deal. I mean technically the fire isn't by the fire alarm panel or else you'd be at the secondary emergency response point. So there's no harm in people taking their gloves off to use a touch screen. But you're right, there still has to be an intuitive interface. Touch screens and touch controls themselves are completely a different technology for a lot of people as anyone who's ever 
misspelled something on their cell phone <laughs> knows. Um, it's not always easy to get the right touch. It's got to be intuitive. It's got to be quick. It's got to be precise. And it's got to be a better thing than what we have now. Tom, you want to add any more to that? I was going to say take the glove off. <laughs> um, because when you think about it, if you're responding to a structure, um, just like you just said, you're, you're, where you're going to get your information is usually your initial point of entry. Hopefully you've gotten there soon enough where that's not where the fire is blowing out. Um, so although you're going to be turned out, usually the last thing to go on are gloves and your face mask, uh, especially for a first officer who's trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, the number two thing that, that is helping out a lot with that and doing a lot more of the pre-response thought process, we'll say, is alarms that are transmitting by point where we have contact ID or another format, but we have exact point identification of what's being called into the monitoring center, what's being dispatched to the fire department. And a lot of departments went to a reduced response for automatic alarms because of the unwanted alarm condition. According to code, we don't have false alarms anymore. They're called unwanted alarms now. <laughs> Evidently, we were hurting the panel's feelings. No so, <laughs> so we have unwanted alarms. Um, but due to the numbers, and you know, let's face it, there's, there's been a cry wolf syndrome in the industry for years. And we've, we've been addressing it little by little, you know, additional technologies, verification. Um, but, you know, there's still going to be that guy that puts a smoke detector in the employee break room right next to the microwave they burn popcorn in every week. It's going to happen until we can catch all those. Um, technology is helping us a lot. And one of the things technology has given us is per point transmission to the monitoring center which is slowly inched its way into the building codes. So as that goes on, you know, the dispatch center may get a, a call for a, you know, a smoke detector in a building. Okay, it's the break room again. Well, that may get one engine or, you know, normal traffic or an officer or something to go check it because, you know what, we've been there before. But if all of a sudden you get a water flow switch, a fire pump run, and a pull station, Chances are you're upgrading to a full structural response at that point, and everybody's going priority. Now, that's all done before we even get to the door and have to take the gloves off and look at the enunciator. Exactly. So, so. taking gloves off is obviously a solution. I understand. It, so. It's one step that could help. Uh, and again, I'm segueing a little bit into some of the smart building aspects we're going to talk about in a little bit. Mike, you want to add anything? Uh, to I, I think they, with that? Yeah, they're good with that. I can't touch that. <laughs> So I'll give you a set of gloves. Was there anybody who wanted to add anything from the from, <laughs> from field? Please, take the glove off. <laughs> at this point. All right, let's move on and go to Central Office Communications. I'm going to very quickly, for those people that are not completely aware, Central Office Communication is the way a lot of fire panels will actually communicate to a dispatch to allow for the fire authority to roll. Um, it's not a direct dial to any of the fire departments, but that's what we're talking about in terms of Central mm -hmm. Office Communications. In one of the things that I'm a little bit leery about that is that I always feel like that we don't, when, you, when the protocol rolls across the screen at a central office, is it giving enough information about what's going on at that site? Can we do better in our fire alarm panels by sending additional information to that office to tell them more about what's going on? Fire location, this type of thing. So uh, without jumping too far, but I'm going to go back and this time I'm going to start with Bill. In terms of information out of a panel going to a fire alarm, pa to a central office, can we improve on that? I'm sure it could always be improved. Um, it seems like the trend is more information and quicker, faster. Um, <laughs> but when you're dealing with uh, protocols like contact ID and things like that that are fixed protocols according to a standard, you can only send so much. Right. I'm not certain about how the IP transmission part of it works, but if you're packaging a message perhaps as an IP uh, message, a series of packets, there may be the opportunity there to include a, a great deal of information. You know, in a text message, we can send photos, we can send all sorts of things that way. So maybe that kind of technology could be implemented in some way. But if we're dealing with the old protocols that have been used for years and years, I, I, I think it would be very challenging, perhaps even impossible. So um, the, in terms of my vision, I see more information coming from our fire alarm panels. And again, Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Um, sure. The, uh, the, you're right. The, the old technologies are limited in how much information they, they have. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I think, Tom, you brought up something just before that said, I want to see certain information. There's 
a real risk that you're going to overload people with information mm -hmm. depending on yep. what happens. So it's important to understand, yeah, you can send more information, but make sure you're not overloading them on information. And frankly, if you're going to dispatch people, the information is going to change when they're on their way there. Mm -hmm. So it's, all, it's going to the wrong person. Yeah. And what is the first thing the responder does when they get there? They look at the panel to get the updated information and see what's actually happening. So it's possible to get more information for first responders, but I think the real information, the most up-to-date information, is when they get to the panel and are standing in front of it and seeing what's happening. Tom? I, I agree with them. That's when you're going to get your, you know, that's your snapshot right when you get there. Yeah, so you're looking at that. I know Gordon and I, for example, in a, years ago had a vision where um, a fire authority could roll up to a building and have the ability to look at the building from a graphical standpoint on an iPad. Uh, we presented that to LAFD. I think it took Dave Myers about 20 minutes to laugh. And then he said, oh, there's no way in hell I'm going to get a firefighter to open up an iPad. Now, I find it ironic they're going to open their phone and text all the way there. But uh, that was one of the things we fought, what, 15 or 20 years ago when we did that kind of thing. But I, I think those kind of communications can be improved on. I think we can make the panels smarter so that they can provide more information, location of personnel, location of fire, that type of thing. So anything you want to add, Mike? Oh, I'm just wondering why I'm here. Okay. Let's, yeah, yeah well, I'm wondering why I'm here. Huh? This is awesome. I mean, these guys are these guys are knocking it out of the park. I walked away from my microphone. Let's uh, let's move on. Is there anything you guys want to talk about now about mass notification before I move on into uh, the other worlds? All right, let's talk about remote. Yes, Jeff. I'm curious. Wait, wait, oh. wait. We gotta get your microphone. Hang on. I'm gonna get shot by AV. <laughs> from a, um, a firefighter's perspective, if you've got an active shooter, okay. how is that different than a normal? Call, or how do you determine that's different? Uh, most someone, of our patients are most of our patients aren't trying to shoot us. That's the first part. Um, <laughs> as far as somebody pulling a fire alarm during an active shooter event, um, you know, believe it or not, if you actually look at the data and a lot of the stuff that was brought up with NFPA 3000 and everything else, and a lot of the research with it, most of the time, you know, that they were told the fire alarm system was activated. Usually when we actually looked at the data, looked at the historical logs and the actual systems, we found out it was activated by a smoke detector, primarily either by smoke from discharge of firearms or the concussion shaking the ceiling tiles, knocking the dust loose, to be honest with you. Um, at the incident that they had in Florida, the pull station was activated at one point by a staff member to evacuate part of the building, which was, I believe, don't quote me on the video, um, against what their standard protocol was supposed to be. Um, there were some, at the very, inter at the very uh, beginning part of the active shooter, we'll call it phenomenon for the moment because that's a nice politically correct term, um, there were instances where manual stations were activated. Um, and then, you know, we know that for years and years, and everybody in this room has been through it before, when the fire alarm goes off, you line up and you walk out the door. Um, there are other things already that have been changed into building codes. There have been refinements to the building codes that allow you to utilize existing exemptions to reduce the number of pull stations or manual stations in a, in a school building. Uh, for instance, all new school buildings over a certain size have to be fully sprinkled and, and have alarm systems, voice-based alarm systems in them. If I have a fully sprinkled or fully detected building, I need one manual station at a location approved by the AHJ, which is probably going to be in the office, because how is a classroom going to call a fire alarm into the office? They're going to use the phone system. Sure. So whoever's answering the phone is where the manual station is going to be closest to. Same thing if they have a button or an activation for active shooter um, into a mass notification system. It's going to be in the office. They're not going to be throughout the spaces. Tom, Did you want you. to answer that one? <laughs> I didn't want to take it from you if you wanted to answer that one. Thank you. Okay. I'll pay you later. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Please wait, wait until I get the microphone because again, I got chewed out. Amber? So um, we also tie in other systems, so access control. Mm -hmm. So do you see that probably pull stations will be just the minimal because if a pull station is pulled, that gives access control at 
free to get through the building anywhere. So you see that probably in the future where pull stations will not be at every exit. That's a damn good question, actually, and I uh, appreciate you that. Can have that. Uh, because access is one of those things in terms of wh where I move with smart buildings, uh, where they become one of, the in the, one of the systems within that building that integrates into the ultimate smart building and the, the idea behind that. So I'm not going to not answer your question, but I'm going to push that towards the end and talk a little bit about the integration of these systems within a building and how they all work together within the fire alarm panel. So I'm not negorying you, unless you guys want to add something to it right now. I'm just going to save that till we get to smart building. That's fine. Is that all right? Is that okay? All right. Let's move to remote service on a fire panel for a minute. And let's talk specifically about fire panel operations conditions. So if I had uh, the ability, and I think somebody mentioned today that they've been going into this. How many came into this building and knew the fire alarm panel was in trouble? <laughs> okay. So I, I, the, the, the irony was this panel came to me and said, do you guys realize that we have the NFPA show and the fire alarm panel's in trouble? And I said, well, okay, that, that, we discussed that. And I'll leave this to Mike being a contractor. You want to discuss a little bit about how that all works out in terms of, of remote condition capability? So. Well, I'm, I, I wasn't aware that the system was in trouble, but, you know, <laughs> there could be a lot of reasons why it's in trouble uh, from a contractor standpoint. Um, um, you know, I, I don't have an answer for why it's in trouble, but um, in regards to the actual question, um, what exactly are you trying to, to get an answer? If I was the contractor responsible for this building yeah. and I was getting an indication that I had a trouble signal okay. and I had the ability to remotely go into the panel and identify the specific trouble, would that be advantageous? Because today, a lot of times on the older panels, all I get is a trouble indication. Yeah. And the only way I know any more about it is to roll to that panel and find out. So what I'm yeah. saying, Mike, is it advantageous from a contractor standpoint to be able to get more information remotely? Uh, absolutely. Um, that's just that's a given. Just to, to speed up the process to make sure you're sending the right technician out, I would say yes. Um, again, it depends on your AHJ and how far you want to take that because that if you have the ability to see what's physically going on with your panel, then do you have the ability to do other features that may not be that... Uh, well received, or yeah. so, or allowed, or allowed. Or allowed. And that's I was trying to be. Want to make is that <laughs> some of these stuff that I'm talking about, the the restriction isn't in the technology, the restriction isn't in the innovation. Unfortunately, a little bit of the restriction is in the code that we write, and we limit ourselves on the ability because we're afraid to open it up. So if we walk away from this meeting today with an idea that maybe we can innovate a panel to be more than it is, then maybe we need to take a look at rewriting the code. That's where I'm going. We've got one right here. Hold on. Get your microphone. Um, as the panel said earlier, the code's the minimum requirement. I'm sorry, say it again? As, as the panel said earlier, the code is the minimum requirement. The minimum requirement's a perfect way to put it. If remote service and that, that, that then becomes an add-on, an add would that then be the way around the limitations of the code is that we're now exceeding what the, the minimum requirements of the code? Tom, you want to address that a little bit? Mike, do you guys want to talk about remote access? My answer to that as an AHJ is it depends. <laughs> I also work for an engineering firm. Um, I don't know, do you want to talk about the, the current capabilities well, there or I, the restrictions in the code? I was going to say that there's, abs there's nothing in the code that says you can't send information anywhere you want to. Right. But you also have to be careful where you're sending it what information you're sending and what you expect people to do with that. Because obviously it's one thing to say, hey, there's a trouble on this building and, and you know, the, the convention center has a trouble. And here's the specifics of what that trouble is. It's also different to say, okay, I want to acknowledge it. I want to disarm that device so it doesn't have a problem. And you're doing it from the comfort of your office. That's where the code mm -hmm. has a problem. Yeah, and, and it's based on actual incidents in history where they've had the ability for remote reset on panels. Um, there was an incident at a um, Bell System building in Manhattan many years ago, and if you open up the 72 handbook, I think they still have the same picture in there, of black smoke coming out the door because they remote reset the alarm multiple times. That's why NFPA 72 doesn't allow for remote resetting unless it's approved specifically by the AHJ. Um, so that, that's the one major instance. And then like we had said, if you're going to do, you know, we already know the requirements in Chapter 14 for inspection and testing 
is if we do do any programming changes, which, you know, changes to the local database, such as deleting an item from the, the inventory list so it's no longer in trouble, would require retesting of the system on site. So you'd need to have a technician or somebody on site in order to do that. Now, is that capable? Yeah, is that possible now? It is. A lot of the panels, it is capable. It is possible. Um, but if there were some restrictions that some manufacturers already have some of the restrictions in there, where somebody has to enable the upload-download capability of the panel at the keypad so you know there's a technician on site before you can do that. That's one way to... It's not a workaround of the code. It's one way to meet the requirements of the code and the requirements of the listing. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Anybody else out here? All right, so I'm going to move to the next one and talk a little bit about initiating devices. I told you. And the reason I'm bringing this one up, and, and Tom actually uh, started with it, was NFPA 72 2019 incorporated NFPA 720 into it, which is essentially the CO code. And so now we're beginning to see where initiating devices are beginning to bring in gas detection devices into the fire alarm panel. And we're, Tom and I both know that there's an actual project with NFPA to look at gas detection devices as a whole. But the thing that became interesting to me is that when you talk about a fire alarm panel and you talk about smoke detection and you talk about heat detection, you're talking about an on and off type device. It's either there or it is not. When you start to move into the world of gas detection, now you've got a little interesting issue, and that is that there's level of gas that you have to deal with. So in today's fire panels, you, the way that that's generally addressed is they set two levels on there, and they provide those levels as an output on the panel. But in my mind, the smartness or the innovation needs to come, the ability to handle an analogous device that can handle a zero to 100. Any comments, uh, Mike, thoughts? Um, manufacturers have that today. They have the ability to pick up those those different levels today. So it's it's not it's not something that's not present. It's right. currently present. There's manufacturers right. out there that have this ability. So it's just a matter of implementing it into the system. And, and how much information do you want to put in the fire department's hands um, from the fire side or a, a a auxiliary side as you're you know, gas detection monitoring type system. Right, and you know. again, I'm going to jump back over to Bill and, and, and Mark real quick. In terms of manufacturer, the devices that we see, is it, a, is it an analog value, or are we seeing just two particular values that come from the field on some of these things? Um, for many devices, including the ones that we offer, it's both. You can do something based on a parts per million for carbon monoxide. The truth is, though, the UL standard for carbon monoxide detectors, if you ever read it, it's really interesting reading because they have a balance between the parts per million that the detector actually detects while it's in its operation and for how long it detects that. A carbon monoxide detector, I think it's like over a thousand parts per million, for 60 seconds is an alarm. But I think it's like 80 parts per million, I forget what the level is. It's a much lower level over four hours it becomes an alarm. So when you talk about what does the detector do, somebody's figured out carbon monoxide exposure and it's a balance between how much is there and how long it's there for, and they create an event. And as manufacturers, our carbon monoxide detector goes into alarm when it sees the criteria that it's supposed to do. But we do have more information that you can do other things. Good. That's what I wanted. And that's the thing I wanted to make sure that we see is that we're seeing the development and the initiation of channeling different types of initiating devices. Because there are obviously going to be initiating devices of other type of technologies incorporated, as Tom and I both believe, other types of gas detection that will be incorporated eventually in NFPA 72. So I wanted to make sure. Do you guys want to add anything about initiating devices? Okay. Systems expansion. So one of the things I meant by this was specifically the ability to utilize the, uh, the addition or adding initiating devices to a panel. Some of the things in the older panels are hardwired systems. It didn't allow for a lot of that. So I want to make sure in the future that we have the ability to easily add panels. You guys want to, manufacturers, you guys want to jump in and say how easy it is in each year? I know it is, so. Yeah, you can add um, expander cards that will give you the uh, additional devices, intelligent uh, devices. The, the systems are, 
um, designed to be expandable. If you need a smaller system, if you need it to be larger at some point in the future, try to take those things into account and uh, give a, a flexible um, option. Mark, same thing I know with Siemens. Same thing. Ours are completely flexible. You can mix and match all the parts that you want based on what your, what your building is today and change it all tomorrow. And Mike, from a contractor standpoint, it's a matter of adding wire? Yeah, uh, components and wire. Um, we're, we're good with either one. I mean, when we go into a situation like this and that expansibility, the expansibility is there, you just got to understand what you're, you're adding to and how you're adding to it. So it's, it's pretty common. So again, we're talking about expansion capability of that from a remote service capability. Well, that's so, not a remote service feature. That's so, true. You know, anyway, we'll move on to remote support. Um, anybody want to talk about remote access capabilities? Let's look at remote sur support. And I go specifically to the manufacturer. My thought here on this talking point was having the ability to upload or upgrade the firmware in a fire panel from a factory. And everybody looked at me and said, oh, hell no. Mm -hmm. And, the <laughs> they uh, and they are yeah, still they looking still. at me because it obviously is in direct violation from whatever the code's going to allow us to do. But do, do we need future ability to be able to do that? And if so, what kind of things would we be looking at? So for example, if I wanted to upgrade a, a Siemens panel, Mark, could I do that remotely? Um, the answer, as Tom put it before, is maybe. The question is not so much can you do it, the question is should you do it? And, you know, I have a cell phone and every time some new version of an app comes out, I have a message that says, hey, you got a new version, do you want to upgrade it? And I have to punch in keys on my phone to get it to upgrade. But I also know I'm doing the upgrade, it doesn't happen naturally. Theoretically, you could do the same thing with a fire alarm panel, where the panel even says, I have some new firmware, do you want to upload it? And someone at the panel can activate it and have it work just like that. So it depends when you say, you know, this remote upload, what does it do, what does it mean, and what's the result of it? Because the code also requires, when you make a change, you're supposed to test 100% of what you changed and 10% of the rest of the system, and some people interpret a firmware or, hard, or uh, software change in the system to be, I don't know what change, test everything. Yeah, and I was going to go to Mike and talk about it from the contract yeah. standpoint, and then move over to Tom in terms of the regulation. But again, Mike, again, the, the, you know, to have somebody stand in front of the panel be able to hand talk. somebody from, from Notifier update a panel remotely, that would be an asset, correct? Uh, no, I wouldn't want that at all You'd as a contractor. It. I want my guys there at that panel because we all know when you've done an update on your phone or your computer, it's crashed occasionally. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does. And uh, if that system's down for some weird reason, uh, not a fan of that at all. I would want a technician there doing that. But I, go ahead. It, please. Oh, we have the capability of doing that as well through our networks and whatnot. So um, it's just highly, uh, I don't know, I see this as being a more of a local local requirement than a remote. Okay, perfect. Now, up until now, really, the only time that we would recommend that sort of thing is if there's a new feature that needs to be implemented because the panel is likely already established and has been working well for a period mm -hmm. of time. But if we need to introduce some new feature, some new multi-criteria sensor or something, then the firmware would be upgraded to accommodate that enhancement. But that would also require them to install those new devices and they would be on site as a result anyway. Okay. But again, I still hear the capability of being able to potentially remotely send the software to the panel. Not uh, actually uploaded, uh, but capable of doing it. Are we thinking of the site specific data sure. or the actual firmware? The actual firmware. The actual firmware, yeah, well, that um, would be. Well, it's two different, it's in, in a fire panel, it's two different sections. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, because you got the executive software, which was similar to your operating system for your laptop. Right. And then, which would be your firmware. And then you got your site specifics. Right. Yeah. And I, so. I, I wouldn't want to speak for you on this one, but most of the fire alarm system installers and maintenance people I know use the if it ain't broke, don't fix it rule, yeah. which means just because I came out with a brand new piece of software or firmware means I got no troubles on the system. It's working fine. Yeah, right. uh, unless somebody tells me I need to upload it and change something, I'm just going to leave it as it is. Okay, so some of these delighted innovations that I would like obviously are going to have obstacles to get to. And, and some of them already exist. You just didn't know how happy you were. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, 
I hope so. Any questions about it from you guys? Any comments? We've got one from right over here. So um, updating firmware or software makes me think of my modem at home that's connected to the internet, mm -hmm. which updates automatically. And half of the meetings here have been about IoT and connecting to the internet. Now, so your question about remote support coming from the manufacturer, do any of you see that changing as panels start having remote service and access to the internet? Because you get one bad virus that takes down one panel that could take down a thousand panels. I don't think we're going to be waiting for people to respond to every single panel to punch in the password to update it. But then, you know, um, you see often with firmware and software compatibility issues. So how, how does, I guess, a manufacturer prepare for that in the future with IoT? Yeah. I'm going I'm to jump in real quick here because I know, Steve and I have talked about Internet security and, and that type of thing. UL, I think, has been working strong to try to help uh, do some of that. In terms of what we do, Steve, in terms of, of, of the security we put in our IoT products, there's a lot of development that's going in that area. Do you want to add anything in terms of what we're doing with that? Um, you know, from a manufacturer standpoint, I know you guys, we've all been concerned about the, the, the cyber problem, if you will. I not going to add anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay's just sneaking up here. Yeah, certainly from the gateway perspective, we're spending a lot of uh, time and effort really locking down the firmware itself and making sure we've plugged all the holes and everything and going out to third-party certifications so that we can ensure with confidence that our product is going to be secure for that portal that's in and out of the, of the fire panel itself. Um, bad things could happen, though. I mean, it's, you know, and I think your point's very valid. Is, is I really do. I yeah. think that security is going to be one of those issues mm -hmm. that we're going to deal with in this industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. And because the reason I say that is the guys that are fighting us on this, the hackers, they're going to continue to hack. Mm -hmm. And they're going to try to get into these systems, I guarantee you. So, I, you know, I think the, the gateway in and out needs to be tightly controlled, and there's a lot of stuff that, that's on our shoulders to make sure we take care of as a gateway provider, for sure. So a remote standpoint, I've, I've lost that innovation. <laughs> but I'm willing to give that up. Uh, so. <laughs> From a service provider, I know uh, Mike and I have talked, and I'm going to throw it back at Mike again. The ability to, to know what's going on from a panel, from a remote, but then, like he just indicated, be able to dispatch the proper technician to solve the problem. Let's be honest. These panels are becoming more and more sophisticated every day. They're getting more and more innovative ideas in them every day. And the fact is that every technician can't be the perfect technician for that panel. But, Mike, you want to add, I mean, if you could remote, if your offices could remotely identify a trouble in a panel, would that not be advantageous? Oh, that, absolutely, that would be, to, with an extent, you know, a monitoring-only feature. Um, and it's available today. We can do that um, with our system. Um, it's a great feature. It, it puts the, the call time down. I think it shrinks the call time. Uh, we can get a tech out there that knows what's going on. So instead of having a tech go out there and scratching his head and going, oh, I don't know, I wasn't trained on this, I don't know what it is. So it's definitely a nice feature to have and, and would like to see more of it. Anybody want to add to that while we're going on? All right. So central office. I'm back to central office again because in terms of remote support capability, again, I think the more information we can get to a central office about what's going on in that environment, the smarter we're going to be. So uh, uh, from, a report, from a remote support standpoint, if we can identify, I think I tried to tell the guys in, the, in our team, for example, that when you get a, a trouble signal, it's usually a supervisory signal that says, I have trouble on my panel. Okay, I need to dispatch somebody. And I think Mike said to me one day, he could dispatch up to three different guys to try to work on that one particular panel. So again, I'm pushing back to say in terms of innovation, we want to be the smarter panel, the more information to the central office. Any comments or question about that? I'll comment. <laughs> Uh, smoke detector goes off uh, over the microwave in the break room and, and that sort of thing versus I see three separate things get pulled or something like that at a particular facility. So if that information is getting sent back to the central office, it would seem to me that there's almost a, like a, a waiting system that could be applied to it. Like over time you could say, wow, that building, that uh, instrument has gone off so many times, therefore it has a lower rating, lower rating, lower rating because it just seems to be a repetitive thing versus 
the whole system lights up and wow, we're all on full alert. Is that something that the central office should be looking at? Is that some kind of next generation technology where they start putting that sort of I would, um, I would say that you don't want the central station making that termination if they're gonna dispatch a fire department or not. You know, uh, it's your AHJ to, what, what, in situations like that for uh, the areas that we're in, we have a lot of, uh, not a lot of, particular larger uh, OCFA on these nuisance smoke detectors. They, they've come out and said, you know, we want them as supervisory. You know, elevators, supervisory. They don't want alarms on them, break rooms, if something like that, or they're going to tell you to change it to a heat detector because, again, when they roll, they roll four trucks. Mm -hmm. And um, that's it's, it's, it's a loss of, or a waste of, yeah. So if you can, if, if there's a continuous problem there, they're going to write up a deficiency to the owner, say you need to fix it, you know, um, move the smoke detector away, find an alternate solution. Um, that's what's happened. And they, they have come in and said, you know what, make it a supervisory. No, but they do not, I, I don't think you'd want the central station telling you mm -hmm. uh, how you're going to dispatch or what level of alarm. You said one truck or do you say four trucks, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. yeah, no, and the other thing too that a lot of jurisdictions have got into to kind of help guide the owner in his, his making sure that he wants to make his repairs is if we have repetitive responses to your building, they usually come with an invoice. Yeah, a nice fine. Um, so you'll be billed incrementally for unwanted alarms up to a certain point. And a lot of jurisdictions after that, your alarm system is now taken out of service. You can establish a fire watch until such time as it is repaired. And that's 24-7 fire truck parked in front of your building. Mark's credit. Yeah, if I may, you guys are treating the symptom and not, not the problem. The yeah. problem is I got a detector that burnt popcorn turns it on. And that is really the problem you need to solve. No. And um, I know that there's different types of detectors on the market. Some of many manufacturers have some that are the cheap ones that may not distinguish between deceptive phenomenon and a real alarm. Um, and then there's the more expensive ones that people may not want to put in simply because they're more expensive. But mm -hmm. you know, there's the new standard that UL is putting out, 217 for smoke alarms, 268 for uh, smoke detectors on commercial systems. And part of this test that they required to do as manufacturers is to pass a burning hamburger test. <laughs> I swear, yes. uh -huh. they have burning hamburgers of hamburger a certain test. fat content that can't put it into alarm. They did this because they also changed the standard to make the detectors more sensitive to respond faster to smoke coming from polyurethane foam fires. And they did that because there have been deaths that have occurred because the smoke detectors didn't respond fast enough. And it's simply because polyurethane foam burns a lot faster, creates a lot more smoke, and gets hotter a lot faster, meaning you have to detect it faster. I can detect, the de I can detect smoke really, really fast. The trick is distinguishing that from the burning hamburger. So th to answer your question, it's not the monitoring station. It's not the fire department who makes those decisions. The detector should be smart enough to know the difference. Excellent point, Mark. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, let's uh, move a little bit more to remote support. Does anybody want to add anything yeah, before I get into the fourth element on this? So other than the information you get today from all the fire panels, whether it be a CO or CID, what other information are you looking for in the future that a central station needs? I would, like, I would like to believe at some point that a central station could identify specifics about that location that would aid a first responder. But that's already happening today. To, a, to an nth degree of knowing for exactly the amount of occupancy. One of the things that I was working with when somebody was, how do you triangulate or how do you identify where people are in a facility? How do you identify bodies? Okay. Is that something we can do? Is it possible that the initiating devices, although they have heat detection on them, can they identify where people are located? So you're, you're actually trying to solve the, the holy grail, which is the location part of it. Yeah, exactly. Which everybody's trying to solve. <laughs> exactly. I see the future of that happening. I do actually see that. That goes a lot with what he was talking about when we get into the smart building in terms of access control. Well, how would that play into privacy then? The well, current technology... 
Everybody keeps throwing obstacles at me, and I just keep trying to throw <laughs> ideas out here. For no, the I get team it. To get this and stuff I love up. technology, but yeah. again, you know, you have to come down back to earth. You do. You know. But if we had the objective, if we thought, like you said, the holy grail, we really need to get to a point where we can provide as much information to a first responder or to to a fire authority that we can. Can we work towards that goal? Can we do something as a manufacturer? Can we do something? as a service organization to get that information, and I believe we can, and I think we can get there. And what that makes me actually move in towards the next thing, and we get into the cloud deployment. And one of the things that we ran into in Los Angeles a few years back is obviously everybody's heard, hardwired telephone systems are a thing of the past. I mean, none of my kids own a phone in their home, all right? Every one of them used their cell phone for their home phone. And the reality is that we ran into that in Los Angeles and the infrastructure was failing. So they began to authorize the use of cellular capability for the second line on the, self, on the, on the fire path. So they could actually have now just the one, fire, the one hardwired phone. But I see cloud capability through that same idea where, the, where that cloud information can exist someplace. And this moves very close to the privacy issue of information about that facility. The other thing I got into a conversation with, with Tom about, and one of, the, in it, one of the things that we do in Los Angeles is what's called the compliance engine. Um, in essence, you have a deputized fire marshal who will go in and do an inspection on a building and file a compliance engine requirement for the fire department, and that goes to the cloud. And then they then get a report at the fire department that gives them some identity. <laughs> it's not a deputized fire marshal. In most cases, it's the contractor that's yeah. doing a 72 or 25 inspection that then uploads that data to a third-party data management program. Correct. So it's not a deputized fire marshal. Leave the guys with the guns and the badges on one side of the equation. Leave the contractors on the other. Correct. But the reality is that we're starting to see more and more of that because of the reduction in resource from our fire authority. They don't have as many building inspectors as they used to. So they will then bring in the third party to do these inspections. That becomes another part of the cloud access capability, that type of thing. You guys want to add to that? I've been very interested in that as a sort of a uh, maintenance uh, feature, maybe for campuses or hospital buildings where they may have their own uh, maintenance personnel. If they could get a message on their phone, there's some trouble with the system or some other situation. Uh, obviously not for a fire alarm so much, but uh, for more from a maintenance standpoint, All right, you know, to, to keep them informed, uh, something like that. Based. Yeah, they could get a you know a push notification or something. Uh, I thought that might be a useful uh, application for that sort of uh, technology. Mike, are you using that technology now? Do you guys have cloud-based PMs or anything like that you work with? Uh, not on our contract side. Um, service side has some applications that they use that's cloud-based. Um, when we do our testing and inspections, uh, it goes onto a server, um, a portal, some sort of web portal, and the owners can, owners of the building can then take a look at the reports and whatnot. So we do, we do feature that, but that is a unique software to our company. And Bill, so. that's kind of what you're talking about as well, but additional information. Right, yeah. Again, I was thinking of it more, I guess, from the, you know, an end user, an educated end user who does that sort of thing naturally anyway. You know, some large hospitals, they have their own internal maintenance uh, Mark, people. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're all right. They, there's, there's a lot of usage of the cloud, but the cloud is just a tool to get information from one place to the other. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a question of how is that information generated. And you're right, it's not the guy with the guns and the badge who go and run a sensitivity test on all the detectors in the panel. It's the contractor who does. Um, in the future, maybe it's not even a contractor. It's something that the panel does itself. We all have diagnostics on all of our electronic widgets. And uh, maybe more and more of this diagnostic leads to the system testing itself more. And I know you're going to get into the smart building stuff where it's going to lead into that, but it's possible that some of the testing can be done. I mean, if the purpose of a test is to achieve a certain goal, you don't necessarily need a person to achieve that goal. Sometimes the system can do it itself. That's why years ago we got rid of 
end-of-line resistors and worrying about open circuits on detectors because detectors are addressable. And now the detector not responding is the panel saying there's a fault. It's not that I don't see my end of line or I have a circuit problem, it's I have a device problem. And there's also ways to, uh, to you know, we talked about if you make a change to a system that you have to test 100% of the change and 10% of the rest of the system, if you could certify precisely what has changed, which some systems can do, you can convince somebody, here's exactly what changed. Test 100% of what's on this report and 10% of something else. So there's ways that technology can be used for the system to be more self-testing. And then when it comes to compliance engine, that's just how it's reported and what you do with the, with the data mm -hmm. afterwards. Excellent. Anybody want to add anything in terms of that? I was going to say some of the panels already have that built in. I know one. None. <laughs> OK. So as we alluded to, we're going to talk a little bit about smart building. And this is where I wanted to get back to the incorporation of, of building systems. And so my vision here, my thought here, was essentially that a smart building itself would incorporate, the fire panel became the actual core of the access system, the core of the BMS. Everything that was going on in that building was reported through the fire alarm panel. At that point, it gave somebody the capability to understand how smart that particular building was. It even went to the point, as we talked about, the holy grail of knowing what was within that building. So, for example, we're talking about what information could, exist, could, uh, could assist the public. What information about that building? Could you be providing a fire alarm panel that tells people the proper evacuation method based on the alarm? And again, this is the future for me in terms of where we are with fire alarm panels. And it's not just, okay, now I'm going to open these access gates and allow these people to come out. Yes, I know that I have 12 people in a back room over in this particular area. Yeah, that is a holy grail issue. I agree with that. But I also understand that it's where we need to go. And I believe as a first responder, that's the kind of thing they would like to see us get to. You guys want to add more, Bill, from a manufacturer standpoint? Are we way off? No, we actually, we do a lot of uh, phased evacuation now, whether it's if the fire is on the east side of the building, the voice message tells everybody to exit through the west side of the building. Or if the fire is on the fifth floor, we send a message to certain floors telling people what to do, and other floors or in stairwells, we tell people different things to do. So there's, there's that, that already exists now. Um, healthcare requires completely different sort of things. My favorite is uh, they'll, they, because they don't want to announce there's a fire in a group where there's a bunch of bedridden people who might panic and they can't get out, they'll do something innocuous. Like they, my favorite is they'll, they'll, they'll page Dr. Sparks, <laughs> call <laughs> extension 27, 271, and 271 is a zone where they have the people to go and they go to the nice little old lady in the, in the bed and say, we're going to move to a different part of the hospital now. And they just casually roll them out. And so there's lots of different phased evacuations where the, where the system responds specifically to what the alarm is and it's not all general evac. Is there more information? Is there more things we can do? I've read something about directional sounders, directional notification that can help people to identify an exit by where the sound is coming from. Something like that could uh, perhaps be implemented and useful, although uh, there's a, perhaps in some buildings a very large variety or ways of which that person would need to be directed. I guess the implementation of that could be quite complex. And this goes right back to what you were talking about in terms of an access panel. Do I direct that access panel to open specific doors and, and, and I'll permit people to go based on what the fire alarm panel is telling us? And I believe that answer is yes. I think eventually you're going to see these systems all migrate together and actually become, uh, at least in my vision, the fire alarm panel become the brains of that yeah. building. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. about the products, though. I've got a little trouble as far as having one system being the brains to everything, because if that goes down, I mean, everything goes down. Mm. It's, to me, you have a part of this infrastructure where everything's maybe talking to each other, and that they, you know, depending on whatever the protocol is, that they will initiate, it, you know, through the IoT, you know, as far as the network. But to have one system make all the decisions, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. 
And again, I've, I've seen that objection a lot. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, uh, Mike and I talk about LAFD right now, they will not allow us to integrate a gas detection panel in with a fire alarm panel. They just will not allow that to happen. Um, they do it for various reasons, and I think they still do that, right? Mike? That's correct. Yeah, so I mean, that's some, one of the things. It is an obstacle, but the future to me in terms of a smart building, is I mentioned the Holy Grail, but I also wanna know, for example, in that building, maybe in stored in the cloud, they tell me details about that building as a first responder that I need to know when I arrive. And I wanna be able to identify where somebody can escape or where somebody might be coming out and that type of thing. So yes, I agree with what you're saying, but I think there's other ways to get around that. Maybe the access panel has an override when the, when the fire alarm panel goes down. Again, if the fire alarm panel goes down, that building, as Tom indicated, is gonna to go to a fire watch because there's no fire alarm panel in operation. So did I put that correct, Tom? Yep, and it actually the wording in the code now for special locking arrangements is if there's issues with either system, those doors have to be unlocked. It has to fail safe. So that's where I think a lot of this in terms of that is going to go. Again, I go back to where the information could assist the first responder. That has always been my focus. Well, how do I get more information to the, the, that individual, man or woman, that's standing in front of that panel or in front of that building the, the night of the fire? And I think that's where this future is going to go for these fire panels is to provide that particular information. You guys want to add any more to what I just said? Um, I, I do want to say that when it comes to the first responders and the information that they have, that's really, really important. But the best scenario for the first responder is when they show up on site, everybody's already out of the building standing around waiting for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of getting information to the first responder, it's the building occupants. The first responders are there to, to, to put out the fire, save the building um, if everyone's already out of the building. So the better the system can get everybody out, the less the responders have to worry about people and can get right to addressing the fire. Perfect point. Mike, you talk to first responders all the time. Yeah, um, what's nice is there's, there's information out there. Um, we have equipment that we put in hazmat information, uh, areas of the building that are may, may be, you know hard to get to or you get lost in. So we have that ability to do that, and, and certain AHAs do require that and specifically have sidebar conversations about this. So uh, they're out there thinking about it as well. Hey, Tom, you want to add anything? Or? I think, you know, to address what, what the gentleman had said about one panel doing everything, I think when we finally do get to the whole IoT system, we're, it's going to be a major shift in how we've traditionally thought about the fire system. And it's going to have to be distributed analytics, it's going to have to be distributed thought and management. Um, but in all of the IoT building systems, just because of the life safety factor and knowing that, you know, it's the fire service is 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, um, it is more than likely going to be the last one that jumps on with fully integrated IoT. Um, you know, we've had BACnet out for what for years, where the fire system could give limited information out to other systems. That capability has been there. With a lot of the uh, IP-based panels or IP communication-based panels, that's getting a little better as far as what you can get out of the panel. Um, They've always been a little reluctant, though, on taking information into the panel, and I think that's getting better with some of the gateways. Um, some of the manufacturers that have, uh, you know, listed gateways between building automation systems and panels um, and things like that, where we have a lot of that two-way capability now, uh, and it's there, and it's functioning, um, and it's going to be a, a slow and steady growth till we can get to that true, you know, universal system, we'll call it. Thoughts from the field? Did I, was I able to talk, answer a lot of your questions about that? And again, you know, I've I've also uh, on I've talked to fire uh, firefighters and everything, and, and one of their biggest uh, concerns is when they're going in, what kind of fire are they fighting? What 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 chemicals? What's there? And whether or not smoke detectors, in a sense, that they could detect what kind of vapors or, or what's in the air to be able to let them know, you know, what kind of fire they're going into. Excellent point. So it, not only getting the fire alarm panels smarter, but getting the initiated devices smarter so they can find out more about what's going on. It's a good point. You guys want to add anything to that before I move on? I think that's part of when you're designing your building, you know, hey, if I have a chemical plant, mm -hmm. 
my, my uh, emergency response plan for that building knows that this chemical is in this particular area. And there are plenty of systems that can say, when you go into this area, here's the fire area, here's the detector that went into alarm, hey, there's a portable extinguisher nearby, or there's a hose reel nearby, or there's a power shutoff, make sure you shut off the emergency power mm -hmm. there, or there's all sorts of information that's available. Um, it's not just the job of the sensor to say, oh, I smell this or I smell that. Sometimes it's part of your plan to make sure that they know what's there. I don't need to go into a chemical plant and have a detector tell me, that there's this particular chemical in that area. So it's a, two sides of it. And there's also other reporting requirements when you have chemicals over certain amounts where if they've got computers in the trucks, the second they got dispatched to that incident, there's a flag that can give me at least a, if not an accurate inventory, at least what they admitted to what was supposed to be in the building. <laughs> okay. And so that moves right to the next segment, and I encourage you guys to add anything, but in terms of what's most available from that building itself, what information? What do we gain? And that's where I think the fire alarm panel you talked about being the heart or the, the, the brain. Can that information be stored there, and can it be available to a first responder, just like Tom indicated, from a report? Or can it also be indicated from the fire alarm panel itself? Can we get that information? So anything else you guys want to add to it? Guys, did we talk enough until we're ready to drink beer now? <laughs> I am. So this is supposed to be the Q&A, but actually, my guys have got an idea. First of all, Amber wants me to remind, if you want to share of today's discussions for any reason, my objective is do you guys walk away with one thing in your mind, just one thing, that maybe, maybe we can think about doing something different. Maybe if we need to change the code, we can talk about doing that. Maybe if we can improve the panel, we can do that as well. So if you want to do this, you want to text NFPA to 484848. I don't know where I ever came up with the number, but that's the Who's number available? to use. And finally, there's the raffle. And Miss Amber, would you like to? Uh... Well, I just want to say, oh, uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you very much. Corey, thank you for hosting and leading this through all of this. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Amber, for all your hard work and putting all this together, and Lindsay, of course, as well. So, and all of you for coming. Thank you very much. I hope it was at least somewhat helpful. All right.